Chain of Command, World War II Support Choices. This is the challenge. This is the challenge in Chain of Command, not unique to it, simply because being a historical war game, what we're looking to do is replicate the accuracy of that time period, whether it's uh, late war, early war, mid war. Now, certainly you could explore alternate timelines and play a lot of different units and a lot of different models. But if we're looking to recreate history, if we're looking to answer the question, if you were in command at that moment, not only what deci decisions would you make, but based on the tools and tech historically, how would you go about doing it? And what we see with chain of command is you have the set army lists defining the units, junior officers, senior officers, uh, some included support choices, which might consist of mortar teams or machine gun teams. And then depending on the scenario, you have a number of support points, three, six, eight. The attacker might have some more. The defender might have less. It might be modified by the scenario. But the idea is then you can take these additional points and um, pull from historical lists. Now, being a tank enthusiast, I would love to throw down like five tiger tanks and and play that i would love to have lots and lots of machine gun teams i would love to have everything but a historically not accurate especially late war where we have all of the the tech and the heavy tanks but also from the perspective of chain of command being um, very much about the platoon and navigating with small groups you know a very very focused snapshot of the entire battlefield I don't know if we would have five tigers throwing down on the table. Here are the decisions to make. If you're playing the complete narrative, and, and we see this in some of the scenarios, or if you are really recreating a historical scenario, you might not have access to the most optimal units in the game based on the rules. You might be at a disadvantage with what you can select. And if we're playing historical, this kind of makes sense. There's no way around it. You, you play with what you have. But if we're going to look at it from the perspective of narrative aside, if Fritz has eight support points, what am I bringing to the table? How am I going to select that list? And that's what we're going to explore. Now, being a war game, this is true of Chain of Command. This is true of Battletech. This is true of Warhammer 40,000. These are other war gaming systems out there. You know, Chain of Command has a very, very tight and excellent, excellent rule set. I enjoy the rule set so much. Battletech is also very tight with the rule set, but there's additional components that you can bolt on to increase the complexity. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It does get a little bit clunky here and there, and that's not a criticism. I love Battletech. And Warhammer 40,000, which I love, is just a, a complete mess, a complete disaster with uh, the rules. But all of these systems, so we have excellent rules, good rules, and just hmm, interesting rules, depending on the system, they involve dice. And if you want to do something in a war game, the dice simulate the fog of war. They simulate the probability. If you're shooting at that tank and it has heavy, heavy, heavy armor, it's probably not going to be able to penetrate it. But you roll high, you roll enough dice, even if it's improbable, you might get lucky and it might simulate jamming the turret or jamming the tread or just, I don't know, you got a lucky shot, rear armor, fuel tank, and the whole thing explodes. Who knows? But having something good happen good for me is bad for you. Having something good happen, you want to leverage the dice. Generally speaking, the more dice that you roll as an attacker, the better the odds are that something good's going to happen. As a defender, the more dice you have to roll, either to make armor saves, cover saves, or see if you can block and chain of command. If I'm getting hit with that anti-tank weapon, um, generally speaking, the more dice that I roll, bad things can happen. Well, for the armor, the more dice is the better because I might block it. But you get the idea depending on the rule system. So when we come to selecting the heavy support choices, if I'm going to look at it from the meta perspective, I want stuff that's on the table all the time 
or at my choice and can leverage the most dice. What's interesting for the support choices is Chain of Command is focused on that very, very small segment of the battlefield, but it acknowledges, unlike other wargaming systems, that stuff is going on all around. Stuff is happening on other aspects of the table. So we see some support choices that are not represented by models or units. They're considered off-table. An example would be a barrage, artillery barrage. An example would be air support. This idea that uh, air support comes in, strafes the battlefield, flies away. Maybe circles around again, strafes the battlefield, flies away. We see this with machine gun teams or mortar teams, which are represented off the table. They got to a superior position. They dug in. They're able to command and fire on a greater part of the battlefield. The challenge with these support choices are, one, in the activation. So first, you have to activate them off table and time it. And second, while they can do, they have the potential to do a lot of damage, you have to pick where they're going to influence on the table. You have to pick that area on the table. If you can influence that based on the mission, then you might be able to lure your opponent into there. Uh, the converse is your opponent will look and say, well, here's this giant open field. That's an amazing kill zone for a machine gun team. I'm not going to go through there. I'm going to go through the forest. So there's a lot of what ifs um, with these support choices. So if I'm looking at the meta, and certainly they're exciting, the idea to have air support come in or artillery. I'm going to kind of put them aside because there's too many what ifs and too many things that I need to influence or control. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get the best support choice for my selection. Uh, the second tier now, and I'm going to illustrate this from the perspective of late war Germans because I love tanks. I love machine guns. Uh, the Americans, the Sherman, they've got a couple of nice toys, but when it comes to tanks, late war is, is where it's at. I want to leverage machine gun teams because the machine gun teams, they roll large amounts of dice. So just from that perspective, um, compare that to a mortar team. Yes, the mortar team can reduce cover if it's firing, uh, but essentially it's, depending on the mortar, one or two dice. I'd rather leverage, depending on the nationality, six to eight dice for the machine gun. It's, it's just more dice. The more dice I roll, the more chance I'm going to score kills. The more kills that I score, the, more, the greater the chance of hitting a junior officer or a senior officer. So that's something that, um, depending on the deployment, when I put it out, I have, in theory, some choice when to deploy my machine gun team. I have putting it in Overwatch or I can have a choice of when to shoot. I can also activate it with the chain of command die with an interrupt, which just becomes absolutely brutal on some points when you want to cross or you can catch them in the open. So looking through that army list, what generates the maximum, maximum amount of dice? Subset, secondary to this. Tanks can generate a lot of dice. Uh, they can with the machine guns. One would say not as much, not as much as, so if I have um, my Tiger tank, I can generate for the points, the machine gun to shoot. I can get, depending on the tank, two or three machine gun teams generate a lot more dice. So just on that narrative, one would say, well, Fritz, I'd rather have three machine gun teams versus a tank. The, the counter here would be, depending on the terrain, the tank might be better because I can stay back and shoot that machine gun. And unless you have a dedicated anti-tank team or you have a tank yourself, what can really, I mean, this is the, the historically why tanks were so fearsome. What can really, how are you going to stop that tank? Meaning if I have a machine gun team set up, even if I'm in hard cover, I, I've got that good spot. Uh, that ruined house, second floor, I'm shooting at you, I'm leveraging dice, you can shoot back at me with your infantry teams or your support teams, and you might score some hits, you might score some kills, but you could, in theory, take out that unit. If I've got a tank sitting on the back end of the table, and I can see really, really well, I'm going to be able to hit you with um, 
high explosive rounds. I'm going to be able to hit you with the machine gun. And while turn after turn, I, I might not, in a single turn, I might not necessarily do the same damage as my three machine gun teams. It's going to be consistent over the game because what do you have to really stop it? If you do have an anti-tank team, I'm going to try and stay away out of the optimal range band. And as soon as you show that, I'm going to try and leverage everything on that. So tanks, as much as I love them, very much battlefield situation. The subset, now we get into things that um, can work really well, can work really well in very, very, very focused situations. And they're not the off-table support, they're on-table, so you have some more control over them. Um, this is going to depend on individual tactica and very much, very much the table that you're playing on, the physical gaming table. Examples would be flamethrower teams and sniper teams. So the sniper team uh, is really... I was going to say hit or miss. It is hit or miss in that it has an increased chance of targeting junior officers and senior officers. And one of the ways that um, you really want to bring down the command dice is head hunting. When that senior officer appears on the table, if you can get line of sight, if you can take that shot, you take it. That's why opening up, um, that's why a great tactic is to. There's always a fire team that will move forward first. If you can throw down some serious shock on that fire team, if you can kind of stall that advance, you don't necessarily want to wipe them out. You want to get them lots of shocked, close to being pinned, cutting down their fire. They really can't do much. What that's going to do is, yes, you can have the junior officer remove shock, issue orders, but having the senior officer show themselves to issue orders and remove shock, get that fire team back up, get them out of there, that's when then you can get a shot on the senior officer and then in theory finish off the fire team two hits on the chain of command make those rolls see what happens maybe you spend your command die to negate it we get that out of the way i mean multi layers of tactics but with the sniper team having a better than average chance of signaling out a junior or senior leader officer that's that's good but it's only one role it's only one role on there and it depends very much on a good position so if you're going to take that maybe it'll be one and then i'll take machine gun teams uh, second to brutality and there has been some back and forth on various forums uh, the flamethrower teams especially if it's mounted to a tank the the damage is just insane i mean we're going to roll the dice to see what happens but chances are i'm going to wipe you out anyway i mean you never know i could roll awful it's just absolutely brutal with the damage they do and, and it does represent kind of such a horrific weapon the challenge with flamethrower teams mounted in a tank the range is still pretty extreme but you do have to get up there now we're navigating anti-tank weapons but the challenge with infantry based is you have to get up there and those support teams are usually pretty small they're usually two two-man teams that makes them really, really, really open for um, getting lit up on, well, lit up, irony, irony, on the way in. The way you counter that, of course, is by chain of command dice, ambushes. So as something approaches, you've got your team hidden, something approaches, you ambush, interrupt, deploy, bake, jump off, um, but you're spending chain of command dice to do that. So in the meta, I would say, look at your army list. What's going to generate massive alpha? What's going to generate the best and highest amount of dice? That, that's where I want to build my list first. Then the second list is, okay, maybe not um, total alpha dice, but based on the mission, based on the tech, early war, late war, um, is there something I can throw down that my opponent really can't remove easily? And it's just going to be consistent dice, turn after turn after turn after turn. And then below that would be special operations, special what if, if I can make this, this, and this, and this happen, then it will be very, very effective. That would be the meta way. But again, the narrative way, the historical way would be to look at a battle, look at an operation and construct your lists and your tech to that. And that's going to limit your choices or maybe not always make things optical, uh, optimal, but that would be a more historically accurate type of war game.